We think that not talking about death to those around us is an act of love, but it's not, it's cruel. We have to be clear, I would prefer not to dot dot dot. I would prefer if we could dot dot dot. What does it mean? What will it look like? Yeah. What's the upsides and the downsides? Yeah. Yeah. How will it affect quality of life? Yeah. And we're not, we don't feel that comfortable about asking those quite penetrating questions. Do you know? But a, a lot of people don't want to have those conversations. My sister was in denial yeah. about where she was until literally her last breath. So um, this is an act of love for those around us. The script yeah. to follow, yeah. including yeah. the medics and yeah. the people that you love. So we've talked about the advanced planning umbrella, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there's all sorts of things that can go in the advanced plan um, through from the very end bit, funeral arrangements, wills, etc., cetera, um, to the softer stuff around what, how you want to be cared for, where you want to be cared for. Mm. But I sort of sense that you're quite happy to dive in at the hard part and talk about advanced decisions to refuse treatment. A very lovely friend of mine, her mum is in a home, has been for three years not knowing anything, having had a heart attack in her garden, the place she loved the most three years ago. What a wonderful place that would have been to die. Mm -hmm. And yet paramedics rushed in and had to try and resuscitate her. Yeah. I like the point you made about dementia mm. um, and that sort of brings up to do this now while mm. we have capacity yeah. to do it. Yeah. And have you discussed your plan with your, your family? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they know what's in it? Yeah, we've been talking about death and dying for, for quite a while now, and it's become a very natural conversation to have within a family. My mother-in-law, who's 87 now, the wonderful thing is that I'm able to talk with her and I'm able to talk with her two daughters about what's coming up, and we've talked about her funeral arrangements well, and, and her end of life. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be an impossibly difficult conversation no. to have. Luckily, she's willing to talk. I know a lot of people uh, uh, are less willing. Um, but that's why, if you're less willing to talk about it, write it down yeah. and lodge it somewhere. We have to try and be able to talk about it dispassionately before we get to a moment where it's just front and centre and there's just, there's just terror. We're in it. Claire had a lot of treatment, didn't mm. she? Mm. Yeah, and I wonder how that has affected your thinking for what you would want. There's quite a few things that came along with, with my sister's treatment and dying that really changed how I thought about things. Um, you have to know when to say stop. Mm. Um, and you have to have the, the health professionals around you who are able to have the conversation about there's no point in carrying on uh, a medical treatment. We have to now start to look at the palliative. And what's glorious about palliative, and the studies all over, the sooner the palliative comes in, the longer you live and the better quality of life you have. Mm -hmm where we're fit and okay, is sort of trying to describe to ourselves and to others what quality of life means for us mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is, a what is a good quality of life, what isn't? Mm -hmm. And when that good quality stops, maybe that's when you wouldn't want any more treatment. But thinking about that way ahead of yeah. actually, as you say, being right in the, yeah. in the moment. Tell me a little bit about, you know, your preferred place of death, where you want to die and who you want around you. I would very much love to be able to die like my sister died. I would love to be able to die in a space that I'm familiar with. I don't know if you want a lot of people around you. A friend of mine, her mum was busy dying and her dad was at her bedside the entire time, just hour upon hour upon hour, day after day. He desperately needed to have a poo. <laughs> Went off for a poo and she died. Whoa. She was waiting for him to leave. I love that you were very happy to dive in at the dying bit because mm -hmm. that's what people try to avoid more mm -hmm. than the after death bit. So mm -hmm. they're very much more comfortable talking about, oh, I want this music at my yeah. funeral, I want these flowers, I want this, that and that. But t tell me a little bit about what you want for your funeral. Then. I find that so wild that people will have a co-op funeral plan for 30 years, but nothing organised yeah, for the time <laughs> running up while they're still physically with us. Yeah. And um, look, the funerals, they're for the people who are left behind. We're very lucky to have a cottage in the hills in Scotland and I'd love a hole there and just dump me in it, put a beech tree on me. I also make a lot of things out of wood, load all the stuff I've ever made and torch that. 
that would be great. <laughs> and dance around that, having okay. fun. So how important is leaving a legacy to you or, or not? There will be some form of legacy in just the work I've done, the yeah. films I've done and the books written and whatever else. Um, but the proper legacy is in the hearts of the people around you who've loved you and who you've loved. Um, and that will last for as long as your name is talked about within a group of friends or a family, and then it will just gently drift away. You've been getting your affairs together recently, so all the paperwork. Again, it is an act of love to get a file together, to get a box together with bank details, your digital legacy, your accountant, your NHS, your passport, your driving license, yeah. all of this stuff your pensions, your credit cards, and they will love you and bless you for that. And it's just even the registering of the death, that yeah. you can just pick up the documents you need to go to the registrar yeah. and off you yeah. go. It is uh, untenable when you're in the white heat of grief the first few days after a death, especially with my sister, is phoning up a credit card company, explaining what's happened, and then saying, we can only talk to the account holder. And you make a list of it and, and, and leave it where people know how to access it. Some situations we may go away and write up the mm -hmm. first draft mm -hmm. of their plan and present it back. And they're happy then to go, no, not that, or maybe have that. Again, be grown up enough to have these discussions about social care, about uh, community nurses, about palliatives, about the hospice doctors, about all of this, and try and find ways of having people dying in places that they have chosen to die in. Uh, and of course, it's, it's, it's not always possible, but let's at least try. This is the advanced plan for end of life. Legally binding. Legally binding. My overriding priority is quality of life. Therefore, interventions which may prolong life at the cost of quality of life would not be accepted. I think this is very clear. Your wish is to be allowed to die naturally with mm -hmm. as much awareness as possible. Mm -hmm but the pain and discomfort being managed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Quality of my life outweighs the importance of length of life. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's the bottom line, isn't it? That we're, that we feel now that it just, we failed if, if we haven't just thrown the kitchen sink at everything. Um, and, and Extraordinary measures. Yeah, and, and, and a well-lived life doesn't matter how long it is, really, does it? Thank you.